Hi everyone, my name is Becca Jo, and it's my privilege today to introduce you to Jake Garn, our speaker, former senator, and also an astronaut. He was born in Rich, Richfield, Utah, and he attended public schools in Utah here, and he's a graduate of Utah, the University of Utah of Salt Lake City, and received a Bachelor of Science degree in Banking and Finance. Um, he served as a U.S. Navy, in the U.S. Navy as a pilot, and also a mayor of Salt Lake City. He also was a senator and was elected in 1974, where he served six years as a chairman of the Senate, Senate Committee of Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. Um, in November of 1984, Senator Garden was invited by NASA to fly as a payload specialist on the Flight 51D of the Space Shuttle Discovery. During the seven-day mission, he performed various medical tests. Discovery Flight 51D landed at Cape Carnival on April 19, 1985, after orbiting the Earth 109 times. In December of 1992, Senator Gard received a very prestigious aviation award the Wright Brothers Memorial Trophy. And we'd like to welcome him and invite him to come and speak. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased to be with you today. And at my age, I'm just pleased to be any place. But uh, the thing I want to talk to you about today mainly, is all of the opportunities that await you in the future. I can't even begin to imagine what you will be able to do with your lives with the explosion of technology we have had. Because if anybody had told me, little Jake Garn from Richfield, Utah, that I would orbit the Earth 109 times at 25 times the speed of sound, sure I will. Because I was 27 years old. Young Navy pilot stationed in New Kuni, Japan, flying spy missions up down the east coast of China when Sputnik flew. So you got a little basketball-sized satellite up there, and all it's doing is going beep, beep, beep. It had no other function but to send back a signal to prove that they had placed something in orbit. So even at that point, how could I imagine that I would be a shuttle astronaut? But it happened, and if you don't remember anything else I say today, that's what you should remember. The amazing opportunities that await you in the future if you continue to train your brain, continue to learn and study, because the speed of technological change is so much more rapid today than it was when I was your age that I can't possibly, even with my wild imagination, I can't possibly predict the amazing opportunities that will await you in your future. Because as I mentioned, how could I have predicted my own opportunities? In mentioning opportunities, how fortunate we are to live in this great country. It took a long time for me to realize that when I was young because I had never traveled outside the state of Utah until I was 19 years old. In those days, you didn't travel much, and a friend of mine who attended Utah State uh, invited me up here, and we decided that we would go up and see Bear Lake. We got up to Bear Lake and realized the Idaho border went through it, and neither one of us had ever been out of the state, so we crossed the border into Idaho. And I came home, and my mother said, why are you excited? I said, Mom, I've been out of the state. We went to Montpelier. And I thought that was just absolutely amazing. Well, the next year I went on my first midshipman cruise on a World War II destroyer, Edinburgh, Scotland, Oslo, Norway, and La Havre. The Navy recruiting posters were accurate, join the Navy and see the world. But even at that point in my life, could I have imagined being an astronaut? Absolutely not. And again, I'm going to mention it for about the third time. If you don't remember anything else I said today, 
stop and think about how important it is to educate your brain and so that you can come back and stand in this very spot someday and tell all the young students about all the amazing things you've been able to accomplish, things that don't exist today. They haven't been invented yet. And that's the only thing I regret about my age is I'd like to stay around a lot longer. And uh, I told my wife that if I could go to Mars, it was only a one-way trip, I'd have to go. She said you'd leave me, and I said only for Mars, dear, <laughs> not for any other, not for any other reason. But amazing opportunities do await you in the future, and one of the reasons they do is because of the Constitution of the United States. It took me a long time when I was growing up to realize that other people around this planet don't live the way we do and have all the freedom and opportunity and the choices to make. So many dictatorships still here on Earth, robbing wonderful human beings of amazing opportunities that we enjoy here in the United States. So don't ever forget how fortunate we are to live in a country that allows us our freedom of choice to decide what we are going to do with our lives, to set goals and achieve them and then be able to pass that freedom on to our children and grandchildren. But let me tell you about the space flight, because my wife says that someday, and I can't remember who she is or any of our seven children, seven in-laws, 24 grandchildren, or three great-grandchildren, that I'll remember every detail of my space flight. Oh, just things like the main engine started 6.8 seconds prior to launch. We were delayed on my launch day for about four and a half hours. I've been laying on my back on the shuttle, and I did a lot of medical experiments. And so I had automatic blood pressure and pulse reading devices, and despite my advanced age, my because I still run and exercise and go on 100-mile bike rides and so on, my resting pulse rate is very low, and about 55 beats per minute. Well, I've been laying on my back on the shuttle four and a half hours because we were delayed because of a ship in the recovery area for the solid rocket motors. And so I could read my pulse and blood pressure, and it was very low. Finally, when they announced we were going to go in on the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and 6.8 second prior to launch, the main engine spool up, producing a million pounds of thrust. And then at zero, the solid rocket motors ignite, producing 6.6 .6 million pounds of thrust. So now you're riding 7.6 million pounds of thrust. And I looked down at the monitor, and my pulse was 138, proving you get an aerobic exercise laying flat on your back doing absolutely nothing. In two minutes, you're 25 miles downrange, 160,000 feet above the earth. So you've averaged 80,000 feet a minute rate of climb for the first two minutes and accelerating, even going faster. In my personal single-engine four-place airplane, I'm really excited when I get a 1,000 feet per minute rate of climb. In eight and a half minutes, you're inserted into orbit more than 200 miles above the Earth, 25 times the speed of sound, which produces an orbit around the Earth every hour and a half. And your orbit tracks, although the shuttle is going in a straight line because of the Earth turning on its own axis and orbiting around the sun, your orbit tracks are elliptical. You're down over Africa, or down over Africa, back up or over Europe, down over uh, New Zealand and Australia. So your orbit tracks are like this. And because you're going all the way around the Earth every hour and a half, you have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every single day. 45 minutes of daylight and then 45 minutes of darkness. So a watch isn't very helpful when you're going through all 24 time zones every hour and a half. All your checklists are from mission elapsed time, from the start of launch, to day one, hour three, rather than being able to use a watch. But it's an amazing experience, not just the thrill of an old military pilot being able to travel at 25 times the speed of sound and orbit the Earth 110 times, 
but it's a life-changing experience about our attitudes of how we treat each other here on Earth. I just returned Monday from Moscow because the astronauts and cosmonauts of this world, we have a convention, a meeting someplace around the Earth every year. I hosted it in Salt Lake City in 2005 and told the astronauts and cosmonauts that I wouldn't host it unless they're an astronaut or a cosmonaut who visited every school district in the state. And it was so successful of reaching out to young people that it's still done at every convention. I went to St. Petersburg and talked to four schools in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, last week. But the point I want to make about the Association of Space Explorers, it changes lives. And someday, when space travel does become as common as airline flying is today, will change how, change how we treat each other. Because when you're out in space and look out into the galaxies and realize that there are more galaxies out there than all the individual grains of sand on every beach on Earth, and we've got to fight and kill each other, and have all the wars we've had based on race or language we speak, silly difference of opinion that make no sense whatsoever. Because when you realize how insignificant the planet Earth is in the overall scheme of things, we're all children of God traveling on Spaceship Earth together. And that's why Alexei Leonov and I are brothers. And I took him to my hometown of Richfield and he stood up on the stage and put his arm around me and said, I'd like you to know that Brigadier General Garn, I'm a Major General, I outrank him and he has to call me Sir. But, because we have seen this Earth from space, he's my brother. And that is the attitude. There's still just a few over 500 people on this planet who have had the opportunity to be in space. My wife says I will always complain that I didn't make the top 100. I was only the 164th human being to travel in space. But again, beyond the technology, all the advancements we see from it, <coughs> Space travel someday will change this planet. It will eliminate wars. It will eliminate the vast differences of opinion we have when everybody realizes that we are all traveling on Spaceship Earth uh, together. Now, re-entry is exciting to say the least. After a week of zero gravity where you can make a jet engine out of your mouth, you'll Pull yourself back across the cabin, do loops, and barrel rolls. Uh, you can be the world's greatest gymnast in, in space. Mary Lou Retton wouldn't have a chance compared to uh, zero gravity against any of us. But it's so, again, amazing how it changes our attitudes about each other. Now, <clears throat> re-entry, you've been traveling at 25 times the speed of sound. You turn the orbit around backwards over Australia for a landing at Cape Canaveral in Florida. And you have this tremendous burst of the retro rockets to take you out of traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. And then as you descend back towards the Earth, you start interfacing with the Earth's atmosphere at three to 400,000 feet above the surface of the Earth. And the friction between the bottom of the space shuttle and the air as you're re-entering the atmosphere produces a giant fireball. You're literally in the middle of a giant fireball with flames coming up all around the orbiter. So angle of attack of your position is very important because the black tiles will absorb that heat and deflect it. The white tiles will not. So you're literally in the middle of this giant fireball for several thousand miles. And then after that unpowered descent from starting in Australia, we touched down within 200 feet of our intended point of landing on the runway at Cape Canaveral. So it's just an amazing experience, not only for an old pilot, but again, most importantly, of how it changed mine and other astronauts and cosmonauts' attitudes about uh, each other and how we treat each other. Now this with the explosion of technology that you will experience, 
you'll look back and talk about, oh, that Senator Garner's there, the astronaut flew in that old-fashioned shuttle like I talk about the Wright brothers. The speed of change will be just absolutely amazing in your lifetimes. Things that you can't even imagine will happen. You'll be able to come back here to Utah State and stand up here and talk to your friends and students about all the amazing technological developments, all the things that you've been able to experience because you trained your brain, because you were intelligent and capable enough, educated enough to take advantage of those unknown opportunities that will occur just like they did in my lifetime. Now, one of the things I want to prove today is that it's possible for an old senator not to filibuster to go on and on with a boring monologue. And therefore, what I would like to do is to use the rest of the time that we have, rather than just giving a monologue to you, to respond to any questions that you would like to uh, ask me. It doesn't happen to be just about space, politics, or public policy, or anything that you might like uh, to know about. So, and if you don't ask questions, you'll get another speech, so I wanted to warn you. The question whether I felt that there was a turning point in my life, absolutely. It was when I was in uh, college and a dramatic turnaround, uh, the difference between grade school and high school and college and maturing as you get older and so on, of setting goals that I wanted to achieve. And that occurred at a point in my life of just about where you are right now. And so I would encourage you, it doesn't mean that while you're still in school you know exactly what profession you want to follow or exactly you want to do. But I'm talking about setting goals. Always having goals to accomplish in front of you. And even at my age, my wife said, tell me what some of your goals are lately because they're just internal. But I constantly have things to achieve every day, every week, every year, looking to the, the future. And so understand how important it is what you're doing right now, of training your brains, of educating yourself, and starting to plan for the future and making decisions that you can come back and talk about all the amazing things you've been able to accomplish because you trained your brain. question is what I'd like to see done with the welfare system. Well, maybe I shouldn't be this personal, but uh, first of all, I have a brother-in-law I'd like to get kicked off of it. The reason I say that is used as an example. There are a lot of people in this country that we absolutely need, obviously, unemployment, food stamps, welfare, who for no reason of their own have gotten into difficulty and they deserve to be helped. But there are people like this young man who I'm talking about who have decided to make their living by being poor. He has an MBA. He's very well educated. He lives in a house in Northern California with no water, no plumbing, no electricity. Gets food stamps and welfare, and once in a while he'll go get a job temporarily so that he can requalify. We don't do a good enough job for the truly needy, for those who are in trouble because of no fault of their own because of so many who are abusing and misusing the system, like this guy. So that's where the reform, in my opinion, should come in the, in the whole welfare situation. And this is one of my favorite books. Oh. One of the best I've ever read. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Gee, am I that boring today that you don't even have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about Obama quitting the space program? What I think about Obama and the space uh, program, I don't even comprehend his, and you can't just blame him, Congress agreed to stop flying the space shuttle and to make us dependent on the Russians to get to the space station, paying 55 to $60 million per passenger 
to get American astronauts to the space station. Plus, we also endanger the space station because Soyuz isn't nearly as big as the space shuttle. And if some of the bigger parts of the space station fail, we will undoubtedly foul up the space station because of the inability to repair it. So I don't even comprehend stopping the space shuttle until we have a replacement vehicle. Now, people talk about the big deficits and the expenditures of Congress, and they are out of control. Most people are shocked when I tell them if we forget stopping the shuttle from flying, if we eliminated NASA, any guesses of how much of the federal budget we would save this year if we just said shut down NASA? Five. How much? Five. Five what? Five percent? Why don't you try six-tenths of one percent? So we're essentially saving pennies by eliminating the shuttle and all the spin-offs. We've normally gotten back from space flight eight to ten dollars in spin-offs in the private sector for every dollar we've ever spent on NASA. Now I can't make that claim for any other governmental agency. Things like Velcro, not that NASA invented Velcro, but basic research and development has allowed the private sector to then produce products from the basic research and development that has been done. And people will also say, well, why do we waste money in space when we have so many problems here on Earth? We've never wasted a dime in space. There are not any stores out there. Every dollar is spent here on Earth. And not too far from here at ATK, Thiokol. There's a lot of jobs at stake out there in the space program. Highly skilled engineers and technicians and so on. And so I, in answer your question, I don't even comprehend why we would stop the space shuttle until we have a replacement vehicle with so relatively small expenditures compared to the rest of the federal budget. And I can't make the claim for any other federal agency that we get that kind of return for our taxpayer dollar. Yes. My question is, you, you talked about um, as, the, as space flight becomes more of a reality for more and more people, will change our perceptions. And my question is, how do you see the nations of the world uh, going and responding to that? And related question, how can we ensure that the rights guaranteed to us in, in our Constitution, uh, that those continue to be maintained? Well, it's a question about the future of space flight and how we cooperate with each other. And obviously, in terms of his question, you look back at all the difficulties and the wars and so on and say, well, how do we continue to cooperate? Get back to what I've said two or three times now. As more people fly, it will make it possible because then we won't have to create these artificial differences. We can work together as human beings traveling on Spaceship Earth rather than, well, I'm an American, Russian, Saudi, whatever it happens to be. The reason I mentioned Saudi Arabia is our next convention of the astronauts and cosmonauts of the world will be in Saudi Arabia. And I can't emphasize enough what I've already said of the friendships we have regardless of our nationalities and how we work together because we have seen this planet from space. So it's guaranteed as it becomes common it will change how we treat each other and solve the problems you're talking about because we won't make those, those differences are as silly as if we say, well, you've got hair and you don't, so uh, I don't know which one you want to discriminate against, the hairy one or the bald one. But uh, we will eliminate so many of those problems we've created over the years when more people have had the opportunity to see this planet in space. I'm sorry, I can't hear you with the background noise. Uh, our, under the, the United States is unique because of our, our Constitution. You mentioned earlier that's what has brought about so much of this. Uh, in other countries, they don't, they don't protect those rights like we have our protected here. So how can we, as we grow together as nations, continue to ensure that our rights are being protected? Well, I think I heard most of your comments, and having been in Russia last week, the change is so dramatic. Just as an example, just in traffic, I could not believe 
how freeing up, giving people their free agency in Russia has changed that, that country. Because before, only the government had cars many years ago, and Moscow was empty. Well, now there's private businesses. And uh, so I can't emphasize enough, I didn't hear all of your question, but how we will treat each other when we understand how artificial the differences we have been made over the years based on language, color of our skin, and all of that kind of stuff. We will become citizens of this planet. And with that, you look at the countries that have progressed the most, we have set the example with the freedom of opportunity of how talented individuals are when they are free. And that's what's happening in Russia now compared to their past uh, lives. Um, I just had a question. Is, what do you think, uh, is there any way to make space economically viable? You know, we see uh, uh, Virgin, Mobile, or the guy from the Virgin Mobile working on private space. What about, what about, I mean, is there any, anything out there that can make it more economically viable? Well, the question is, how do we make spaceflight more economically viable? And you've got uh, Virgin Galactic and so on that are going to produce space flights, at least suborbital flights, at a couple of hundred thousand dollars a passenger. So it's not going to be economically fe feasible for several years, at a minimum. Uh, but it will become so. When you look back at so many other things in our society that were way too expensive for the average person, when they started, automobiles. Boy, that was really uh, a rarity when there's so many cars were available even here in the United States when I was, was young. And uh, now multiple car families and so on. So you look at the changes that have occurred in what we take for granted as technology today. It'll change. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, when you consider that uh, jet airplanes weren't flying when I learned to fly. And now it's just commonplace for, uh, for everyone. So what you're talking about, the change will come, it will happen. No, no doubt about it. Any other uh, I, I just wanted question? Uh, one more follow-up question was, uh, like I heard that there are, are certain things that are mineable on the moon, like the question is about mining on the moon, Mars, and so on in the future. Well, I'm sure that's many decades away. But yes, it, it will happen. There, there is no doubt about it. And someday uh, Mars flights will be as common as we're talking about uh, orbiting the Earth today. No, no doubt about it. If you go backwards, I've, I've mentioned this several times, but particularly with my perspective in, in my lifetime of learning how to fly before jet airplanes were, were flying. And now it's so commonplace, a lot of people said, oh, we'll never be able to travel all the way across the oceans. We'll have to stay on ships. So what you're talking about is just as possible of what we've seen happen, in, at least in my lifetime, over a few few decades. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Um, with that shuttle program, what is the future of NASA like? What does it look like? Without the program, what does NASA look like? Well, NASA will continue to uh, work on the future of, of Mars flights and things like that, but there is absolutely no plan right now for any type of suborbital vehicle to replace the shuttle, just absolutely non-existent. Are Orbital and SpaceX already on contract with NASA? Sorry. Orbital and SpaceX are two U.S. companies developing um, um, launch, launch vehicles that can potentially launch humans. 
I thought they were already on contract with NASA, at least for prototype development of um, manned spacecraft. That's what I mean. The question is on the commercial development, and yes, uh, NASA does have contracts and they're working with them, and some government money is going in to produce the first commercial uh, space flights. But as I mentioned, it's still several years away, but it is a cooperative thing. Private sector at this point couldn't do it all by themselves. They need NASA to participate uh, with them. <laughs> The question is, what is my opinion about extraterrestrial life? Well, I'll guarantee you there's life out there someplace. When you consider just our own galaxy, and our, I don't know how many millions of galaxies are there out there, to make an assumption that this one little tiny speck of dust called Earth is the only place that human life exists, to me that isn't even possible. It's, if you believe in God as I do, uh, that he created everything, he wouldn't really be that wasteful, would he, to create the whole universe and just pick the planet Earth and say, well, that's the only place I'm going to put my kids. That isn't even like me saying, well, I've built every house in, in Utah for one family. And that's a small, tiny fraction compared to the the other. So there's no doubt in my mind, and uh, even if people have uh, got some people that are atheists, and if we just evolved the size of this universe to say that even if you don't believe in God, that this is the only place, we're not even a grain of sand in relationship to the beaches of this earth, let alone out of the whole galaxies. So, someplace out there, there's a lot of life. There's no doubt in my mind that there is. I think it's impossible for there not to be. What is Earth like from up there? Well, the question is, what is Earth like from up there? It's so magnificently beautiful. And it really is a blue planet because two-thirds of the Earth is covered with water. People don't realize that. So, the oceans are magnificently beautiful. And then just to give you an example of something you'd be fairly familiar with, to be able to see the entire Mediterranean Sea all at one time, Spain, and Portugal, and Gibraltar, and North Africa, and France, and Italy, and Greece, and the Greek Isles, and see Egypt, where the blue and the white Nile combine and flow northward to the Alexandria Delta and the Mediterranean Sea, and the Red Sea, and the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River. And I can make those descriptions all over the earth, South America, the United States. The Great Salt Lake is about the size of a dime from, from space. But it's just absolutely amazing to see the beauty and how spectacular our planet is from that, uh, that perspective. My wife says, and I may have already said this to you, that someday when I have Alzheimer's, don't remember who she or any of the kids are, I'll remember every detail of my space flight and the earth. And, and I will, and I still think that little Jake Garn from Richfield, Utah, get to do this, or am I just dreaming it? It just still occupies my mind all the time about what a magnificent planet we live on and how fortunate we are to have all the opportunities that we do on this planet. Yes. This is a Senate-related question, but is there anything you would change in the Senate? in terms of like rules or the committee system or seniority or anything like Is that? there anything I would change in the Senate? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's very simple. Term limits. If we want to really improve Congress, we would have term limits. If I had my way, we'd have one six-year term for president. And whoever the president was, wouldn't matter Republican or Democrat, it wouldn't be all the wind testing. They can only serve once. So be honest and direct and say what you really believe. You could have three six-year terms for senators and change House terms to four years because in today's TV environment, a House member is continually running for re-election for the two-year term. It never stops. Now, you're all too young to know I still hold the statewide records. My second and third term in the Senate, I got 74% of the vote both times. 
and uh, may not have had an opponent for a fourth term. Governor Cal Ramden at the time, Democratic governor and a good friend of mine, held a press conference said, don't run anybody against Senator Garn for a fourth term. We can't beat him. Don't waste the money. Spend it, <laughs> spend it on other races. And, uh, but I believe so strongly in term limits in my whole political career. I always wanted to practice what I preach. My dad was so strict on honesty. You're either 2 plus 2 equals 4, not 4.0000000001. And sometimes I would get in trouble for being so candid and blunt. But I had a woman stop me a few years ago on the streets in Salt Lake, and she said, Senator, I'd like you, and I'm a liberal Democrat from South Ogden, and I voted for you every time. And I said, why? She said, I voted for your honesty, not your stupidity. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So uh, that's why I, I left, uh, because I so strongly believed in term limits, and I was the only one that I could impose them on. Just, just as a follow-up, do you think that would hurt Utah, though, in terms of, like, that, like, if all the senators were equal at all, you know, we only have four congressmen out of 435, would it hurt us, like, influence-wise? Does that make sense? No, I think it would help. I think it would be helpful. Uh, because then you wouldn't get, you know, as long as there aren't term limits, then seniority is very valuable, like Senator Hatch. His position, because of his long-term seniority, uh, is important. But if we did away for seniority for everybody, then it would really equalize Congress. And you'd have so much more honesty in voting in both parties, and instead of the, the wind testing of it's not that public opinion isn't important, but unfortunately, public opinion is not normally very widespread. You get too many special interest groups lobbying on various uh, various issues. And my attitude was, well, the worst by, by always being absolutely direct, candid. If I lose, big deal. I don't want to have to worry about it. If you always say what you really believe you don't have to have a good memory. You don't say something different in San Juan County than you do in Salt Lake County. In the short run, it would sometimes get me in trouble. But in the long run, like I told you about that woman from South Ogden, and once I was on a national TV program and they were quizzing me and one of the announcers said, well, uh, you're just so straight forward all the time. And I said, well, sometimes you just have to call a spade a spade. Well, the NAACP got on me and said I'd made a racial comment <laughs> and demanding an apology. And I said, well, I may be just dumb, naive senator from Utah, from a small town in southern Utah, but I didn't make a racial remark. To me, a spade a spade, you call it like it is. You're honest, you're direct. So I'm not going to apologize for something I did not do. And they got after me for years for making racial remarks. And I'd say, put it in context. Look at what the subject was about. And you know there was no racial comment there at all. So, anyway. Any other uh, questions? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity of being with you today, and if you don't remember anything else I said, remember the opportunities that await you in the future. Train your brains. Educate yourself so that you can take advantage of those amazing unknown opportunities. It will occur. Much greater chance of that than what's happened in my lifetime, and I'm still just absolutely amazed. Just to give you one more example, when I was a Navy pilot, they didn't have separate navigators. You were both a pilot and a navigator. And the way we navigated across the Pacific it was with three star fixes, sextants, sun lines, and drift meters. All the way across, 2,000 miles across to Hawaii, and so on, you're back there drawing with a soft lead pencil on a map. Well, I learned to navigate like that. Now, what do I have in my airplane, my personal airplane? I got a five-inch color GPS. It takes no brains at all. Oh, I put push on. The map comes up. I run the cursor in the airport. Push go to, and follow the electronic uh, signal. 
So just think of that, from GPS is back to me learning to navigate with three star fixes, sun lines, and drift meters. And what was really fun was when you had to do what was known as dead reckoning. Now I understand why they probably called it dead reckoning. If you had overcast, you couldn't get any star fixes or sun lines. And if you're in the overcast, you couldn't even get drift meters by looking down to see, guess which way the wind was blowing. And that's why we had to use dead reckoning. We would guess what the wind and the drift was and soft lead pencil draw these charts, draw the lines on the charts. And the point of it is, with that kind of dramatic change in technology in my lifetime, it's even more rapid in yours. And the things that you'll be able to come back and talk to about someday when you're middle aged or my age and uh, just be amazing the things that you've been able to accomplish if you continue to train your brain. So thank you very much for the opportunity of being uh, with you today. I'd like to thank Jake Garn for coming today as a gift of our gratitude. We have a Utah State blanket for him. <laughs> But I really appreciate this because I've always had a good relationship with Utah State even though I went to the U for many, many, many years. I can't say that about BYU. Yeah. <laughs>